When I first saw this scene in the best Jurassic Park movie, I got goosebumps. Watching this in cinema, it felt like I was right there in the scene. And that majestic music to top it off. Epic. It's a little dream of mine to one day, maybe if things ever become friendly to visitors again, to visit the US and see this incredible Barosaurus mount in the AMNH. The idea of rearing sauropods isn't new. Way back in one of my still favourite dinosaur books, Dr. Robert Barker's Dinosaur Heresies, I saw this incredible artwork. And also this speculative suggestion. It makes sense that rearing would increase the feeding envelope even more dramatically for sauropods, but could they? There are many considerations, but to make this shorter, I'll touch on just two the cardiovascular, and the biomechanical. Now first, the problem of blood to the brain. Sauropods had very long necks. The heart would have to work very hard to pump the blood uphill. With rearing, the head could be 8 to 10 meters above the heart. Now lifting fluid against gravity requires pressure, proportional to the height of the column of blood. Seymour and Lily White 2000 calculated that to perfuse the brain of a fully upright Barosaurus, the heart would need to generate arterial pressures of around 700 millimeters of mercury, which is roughly seven times the normal human blood pressure. In scientific terms, that's crazy. To get this pressure, the heart would work extremely hard especially the left ventricle, which pumps oxygenated blood to the body and brain. As blood pressure increases, the ventricular wall must become dramatically thicker to prevent rupture and to keep wall stress within survivable limits. For a 40-ton sauropod, the left ventricle alone would need to weigh around 2 tons, which is about 5% of the total body mass devoted to just one chamber of the heart. Thick heart walls waste energy, because much of the muscle's work goes into deforming the muscle itself, and less to moving the blood. In addition, such high blood pressure would have damaged arterial tissue once the head was lowered. Collectively, based on just blood pressure alone, large sauropods couldn't have raised their necks vertically. The paper is really a good read, and I'll reference it below. Now, methods have been proposed to address this. Some, like negative cranial pressures creating a siphon effect, are so incredibly suicidal, I won't waste your time describing. Others have some merit, like the giraffe's Riti Mirabile, a dense mesh of small blood vessels near the brain, which helps buffer sudden changes in pressure when the head moves up or down. Still, the absolute pressures involved in a rearing sauropod would have been extreme, so if true, would have required some modification. To date, blood pressure still hasn't been satisfactorily explained. Whether an animal can rear depends heavily on where its center of mass sits. In terms of lever mechanics, the hip we can take to be the fulcrum, the center of mass the load, and the effort would be the collective action of the hind limb and pelvic musculature. For less effort, the center of mass should be near the hips. Mellison 2011 built virtual models of Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus, now Giraffe Titan, in order to investigate the potential rearing abilities of sauropods. The center of mass of Diplodocus is estimated to be close to the hip socket which approximates the center of rotation. This makes prolonged rearing possible and doesn't require much effort to do it. The situation is similar to this forearm bar. If I hold it here, it's easier to move. than if the load is further away. Besides requiring less effort, runs reared up, having a center of mass close to the hip socket is more stable, 
and makes keeping this position easier. Now you may remember this kind of diagram from school. In order to be stable, you want the center of mass to be close to the base of support. If it's too high up, it's easier to tip over. In this model sequence, you see at each point how close the center of mass is to the hip joint and the additional height gain at each point. Combined with its long massive tail acting as a prop, it was also very stable. I think you can see that intuitively by looking at this model and seeing how much tail mass the Diplodocus has can make it a lot easier to act as a useful counterbalance. Giraffe Titan, on the other hand, was found to have a center of mass further forward due to a reduced tail and larger forelimbs compared to other sauropods. Not only is more effort required to raise the front off the ground, once in rearing mode, the center of mass high above the hip socket will make it more unstable, risking a fall and even fatal injury. Even small neck movements would require large correcting motions in the limbs to maintain an upright pose. Even modeling with heavier tails didn't lead to a significantly more beneficial center of mass suited to rearing. So, based purely on center of mass, Diplodocus could probably rear and that for sustained periods, while Giraffe Titan could do so but only for short bursts. Effort and balance issues aside, there's the issue of mechanical stress to deal with. Now first, the bones. When a sauropod rears, the hind limbs suddenly bear almost the entire body mass. This is an external load, which increases the compressive and bending stresses on the femur, the tibia, and the pelvic girdle. Second, the muscles. The forces generated by the hip extensors and the stabilizing muscles would be enormous, pulling on the bones to which they insert. Now these cause internal stresses which further load the bone. In their paper published just this year, 2025, Silva Jr. et al. modeled the forces in these two scenarios. The external loading condition where the red arrow shows the position of the applied load and the yellow circles the constraints. In the internal loading condition, where the numbers represent key muscle insertions. Now using finite element analysis, the results were interesting. In both scenarios, the mean for Mises stress for Giraffe Titan was higher than Diplodocus, but only slightly. Now this probably relates to the center of mass differences between Giraffe Titan and Diplodocus we've noted. But it suggests that Diplodocus wasn't some rearing specialist adopting this behavior frequently or for long periods. But neither was Giraffe Titan excluded from rearing, at least in terms of these mechanical stresses. Now of course, there are other factors. An obvious one being the ability to generate that push off the ground with the forelimb musculature. Now this will be harder the more forward the center of mass. There's also the landing when coming back down. The shoulder girdle and forelimbs would have had to absorb a massive amount of impact in a controlled way to avoid injury. That's a very big ass for an animal weighing tons. Occasional loads might be survivable, but frequent repetition is a different story. Now, some researchers have stated that the absence of stress fractures in the forelimbs and other signs of being pushed to those limits as evidence against frequent tripodal or bipedal behavior in adults. Mellison, however, believed that if rearing were common, adaptations would have taken place to counter this. Silva Jr. et al. acknowledge their study doesn't model cartilaginous tissue or the soft foot pads in sauropods as suggested by Jenel. So their calculated stresses are probably overestimated, but still useful in comparing the different taxa. And finally, I don't know of any study which has studied the stress on the tail itself if it were used as a standing support. 
So what's the conclusion? The answer is definitely nuanced. Rearing is energetically expensive, mechanically risky, and places extreme demands on the cardiovascular system for relatively little reward. So habitual feeding for prolonged periods is unlikely. On the other hand, momentary rearing in an emergency or heat of the moment thing is plausible. For example, as a reflex against a predator attack. Now I can't remember which writer wrote this, it might have been SVPOW in fact, but he said we need more images of predators being squashed, to which I can only offer this. Perhaps a moment of desperation during famine, as in our diorama with the tree stripped bare, and our Sora Poseidon desperately looking, or having just removed the last leaf. Then there is simply the issue of getting busy. Supportive aids like water have been proposed, as illustrated in Jose Antonio Pena's painting of mating Sora Poseidon. This still involves some rearing and there's been thick speculation on how mating might happen without it. Creative fantasies like cloacal kissing and using prehensile and impressively long tools for the job exist, but these ideas seem to strain biomechanical decency. The mysteries of non-rearing mating resists firm penetration, and until hard data emerges, it seems that sauropods must at least occasionally, have been able to rear. So, comparisons. First, we of course compare them to each other. In terms of colour, you see how the stripe is a more conservative one, and certainly looks very believable. It's not plain, and has these faint stripes dorsally, and for a large dinosaur model, I'd like it to have some subtle touches. The blue is of course a lot more flowery, with plenty of complex layering of colours. Now blue as a pigment in such quantities is a real stretch, but as for patterning, I'm sure many of you have read Gallagher's latest paper by now, suggesting that large sauropods might have had more complex coloration and patterning than conservatively argued. As always, I think whichever you get, you'll be happy with. The next most obvious one would be the standing Nanmu Watchman Brachiosaurus. Now this is a model that came out 3 years ago, time sure flies. Now here you see very obviously the Brachiosaurus has a really slender and even thin neck. Our Sora Poseidon model has a really thick neck and a more tapered torso. This makes the Nanmu Brachiosaurus less front heavy, with a friendlier centre of mass for rearing than our Sora Poseidon. It looks very nicely balanced, such that the tail simply acts as a counterbalance and doesn't even touch the ground. Our Sora Poseidon, being so front heavy, has to rely on the tail as a tripod. If we use Mellison's diagram, the Nanmu looks more realistic, and I believe when I reviewed it, I said that while based on Jurassic Park, someone must have felt the depiction looked too unnatural and snuck in a bit of science. Ironically, today's Sora Poseidon has more of that Jurassic Park pose. Both are very nice and represent the advancements of Sculpt in the last 3 years. Honouring the Brachiosaurus, which we later know to be Giraffe Titan, on which so much Sora Poseidon work was based, we bring in the W Dragon Giraffe Titan. Would have been nice to see how this stands against a normally posed Sora Poseidon.
And for Haolonggu closest equivalent, here's the Haolonggu green brachiosaurus. And to show you how our blue Sauro Poseidon compares to the blue Brachiosaurus. And looking at the other big sauropod often mentioned in articles on rearing, we have here the Haolonggu brown Diplodocus. You can see intuitively how this would have been a bit more balanced while bipedally standing. And we should look at the Haolonggu blue Diplodocus against today's blue Sora Poseidon. And you see immediately what a divine paint application we have in today's blue. No superfluous squiggles or chalk marks. In fact, let's bring back the blue Brachiosaurus so you can see how the three blues compare. I would say that today's blue Sora Poseidon is aesthetically more like the Brachiosaurus than the Diplodocus. The other Diplodocus, the worthy Rebor. Starting to get massive, here's the Haolonggu Wellamosaurus. We must bring in the Haolonggu Argentinosaurus. Again, it would be nice to have a typical pose to compare their volumes. You can really see how massive the Argentinosaurus is. And for some contemporaneous animals, here's the fellow herbivore, the PNSO Sauropelta. And then the predator, the PNSO Acrocanthosaurus. Now here's one reason why our Sauro Poseidon might be rearing, and possibly soon to be pancaked. The eye lines don't match. And it would be nice if Haolonggu's inevitable Acrocanthosaurus built this into the pose. Of course, our standard size comparators, the PNSO Wilson and the PNSO Cameron. So that's it for the Haolonggu Sora Poseidon. What a way to close off the year from Haolonggu. Haolonggu has been a godsend. As sauropods are my favourite clade. As you can tell, I have plenty to say when I review them. They've gifted us so much that it can become a blur after a while, but I'd say that this one stands literally heads and shoulders above any crowd. Given the unlikelihood of another huge 1 to 35 rearing sauropod, I'll say that this one, especially the blue, is a strong contender for a spot on your sauropod shelf. As always, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.